Carl Sagan was a friend of mine, and he was a friend of this broadcast and every broadcast I ever did. We appeared in Texas together, in Washington, here in New York. He was always a great guest because he was a great storyteller and he was a great scientist. He came to this broadcast last May 27th, 1996, and he talked about his illness, he talked about science, and he talked about the universe. Here is that interview, May 27th, 1996. Carl Sagan is one of the preeminent astronomers of our time. He is known for bringing the heavens to our living rooms with his PBS series Cosmos. His latest work is The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. It explores the country's growing fascination with pseudoscience, astrology, faith heals the supernatural and the like. All superstitions that he says threaten to undermine true science. I am pleased to have him here, and I also take note of the fact that he is the David Duncan Professor of Astronomy and Space Sciences and Director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University, Distinguished Visiting Science at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and Co-Founder and President of the Planetary Society, the largest space interest group in the world, and a former Pulitzer Prize winner. Welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. Great to see you. Uh, listen to this. I hate to read too much, but this is... It's almost like they've been reading your book. This is from the New York Times for Friday, uh, May 24. Americans flunk science, a study finds. Less than half of all American adults understand that the Earth orbits the sun yearly, according to a basic science survey. Nevertheless, there's enthusiasm for research, except in some fields like genetic engineering and nuclear power that are viewed with suspicion. Only about 25% of American adults get passing grades in the National Science Foundation survey of what people know about basic science and economics. I mean, this is singing your song, isn't it? Well, it's certainly what I'm talking about in, in, in the Demon, Demon Haunted right. World. My, my feeling, Charlie, is that um, it's, it's not that um, pseudoscience and superstition and uh, New Age so-called beliefs and uh, fundamentalist zealotry are something new. They've been with us for as long as we've, been, we've yeah. been human. But we live in an age based on science and technology with formidable technological powers. Science and technology are propelling us forward at accelerating rates. That's right. And if we don't understand it, and by we I mean the general public, if it's something that, oh, I'm not good at that, I don't know anything about it, then who is making all the decisions about science and technology that uh, are going to determine what kind of future our children live in? Just uh, some members of Congress, but there's no more than a handful of members of Congress with any background in science at all. And the Republican Congress has just abolished its own Office of Technology Assessment, mm -hmm. the organization that gave them bipartisan, competent <laughs> advice on yep. science and technology. They say, we don't want to know. Don't tell yeah. us about science Surprising, and because Gingrich is genuinely interested, I think, in he these is. kinds no of things question. as a... You know, no out of a, his own intellectual curiosity. Does the president still have a science advisor? Uh, he does. House? He does. John Gibbon. And, and the vice president uh, is scientifically well known literary. For being yes. Scientifically, a science maven. I mean, you, you blast them all creationist, uh, Christian scientists who sh you say would rather allow their children uh, to suffer uh, than give them insulin or antibiotics. Uh, astrologers come in for particular scorn on your part. <laughs> well, I would say scorn, just uh, derision. Derision. <laughs> <laughs> a more generous version of scorn. You know? and, but what's the danger of all this? I mean, you know, this is not the thing that... There, there's two kinds of dangers. One is what I just yeah. talked about, that we've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this combustible mixture of ignorance and power sooner or later, is going to blow up in our faces. I mean, who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it? And the second reason that um, I'm worried about this is that science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. If, if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us mm -hmm. that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. Have we, the point is made, and maybe by you, you know, is it, when's the last time we had a president who made a speech about science, you know? Yeah, I mean, right. and made I a, say that. You know, 
Uh, it is this notion that, that science is of, not of great interest to us in some sense, that, that somehow we don't want to learn. You see, people read the stock market quotations and financial pages. Look how complex that is. And because yeah, they manage. know the direct connection to their own. There's a motivation, but they're capable, of large numbers of people. People are able to look at sports statistics. Look how many people can do that. Understanding science is not more difficult than that. It doesn't involve greater intellectual activities. But the, the thing about science is, first of all, it's after the way the universe really is and not what makes us feel good. And a lot of the competing doctrines are after what feels good and not what what's okay. true. Okay, but you got to make, I'm not sure you'll go this far with me, but I mean, there's a lot of that that is about feeling good and there's a lot of that that's about hocus pocus, but at the same time, there are millions of people who understand science does not prove religion, but because religion is faith-based. And faith. therefore, you should de not deny the value of it because it is faith-based and not science-based. But let's, based. let's, let's, look, let's look a little more deeply into that. What is faith? It is belief in the absence of evidence. Now, I don't propose to tell anybody what to believe, but for me, believing when there's no compelling evidence is a mistake. The idea is to withhold belief until there is compelling evidence. And if the universe does not comply with our predispositions, Okay, then we have the wrenching obligation to uh, accommodate to the way the universe uh, I mean, I really you is. Could, you, I mean, but I mean, you, so you step forward to say I deny all religion because I can't see no, it proved no, no, no. scientifically. No, no, no. You see, and the it, value it, of religious it, experience it, and the value it, of, of 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 reaching for higher experiences. Let me say, religion deals with history, with poetry, with great literature ethics, with morals, including the morality of uh, treating compassionately the least fortunate among us. All of these are things that I endorse wholeheartedly. Where religion gets into trouble is in those cases that it pretends to know something about science. The science in the Bible, for example, was acquired by the Jews from the Babylonians during the Babylonian captivity of 600 BC. That was the best science on the planet then. But we've learned something since then. Roman Catholicism, uh, Reformed Judaism, most of the mainstream Protestant denominations have no difficulty with uh, the idea that humans have evolved from other creatures, that uh, the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, with the Big Bang. They don't have any trouble with that. The trouble comes with people who are biblical literalists, right. who believe that the Bible is dictated by the creator of the universe to an unerring stenographer. And so therefore they... And, and has no metaphor or allegory. And from it. there they make their political and economic choices. Uh, and social and, choices. And scientific. And scientific choices. And scientific. And that's part of your problem with that idea. Exactly. It is that because for the wrong reasons, we make the wrong choices about science. That's right. So who is more humble? The scientist who looks at the universe with an open mind and accepts whatever the universe has to teach us? Or somebody who says everything in this book must be considered the literal truth and never mind the fallibility of all the human beings involved in the writing of this book. Mm -hmm. Going back to the question of, uh, of adequate evidence on something that's emotionally really, uh, mm -hmm. really pulling you, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I lost both my parents about uh, 12 or 15 years ago, and uh, I had a great relationship with them. I really miss them. I would love to believe that their spirits were around somewhere. And I'd give almost anything to uh, spend five minutes a year with them. Do you hear their voices ever? Uh, sometimes. About uh, six or eight times since their death I've heard it. Carl, just, just in the voice of my father or my mother. Now, I don't think that means that they're in the next room. I think it means that they're in your <clears throat> I've had an auditory hallucination. I, I was with them so long. I heard their voices so often. Why shouldn't I be able to make a vivid recollection of it?
here's what's interesting about this for me. I mean, you won't see this, but I'll throw it at you anyway. You convinced me a long time ago that it was arrogant for me or for anyone else to believe that there wasn't some life outside of our... To exclude the possibility. To exclude the possibility was, right. was, was, to, was an arrogance of intellect that we should not I still assume. Believe you couldn't prove it, you didn't know it was there, but the arrogance for you... Right, we don't know if it's there, we don't know if it's not there, let's look. And if you take that, mm -hmm. why can't you say, there's a lot we don't know. I, there's I a say lot it. of power Here, there that we there's don't know. There's a lot we don't know. You know? I, I, it's what I believe. About but that doesn't mean that every, every fraudulent claim has to be accepted. We we demand the most rigorous standards of evidence, especially on what's important to us. So if some guy comes up to me, in a, a channeler or a medium, and says, I can put you in touch with your parents. <laughs> well, because I want so terribly to, to believe that, yeah. I know I have to reach in for added reserves of skepticism because I'm likely to be fooled and, and uh, much more minor to have my money taken. And what was it, Jay-Z Knight was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. She, she has a guy named Ramtha, who's 10,000 years old or 35. something. 35. 35, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, he tells you lots of things, but nothing about what life was like 35,000 years Shirley, ago. Shirley MacLaine believes. Uh, Shirley MacLaine believes that Ramtha was her brother. <laughs> uh, things like the Loch Ness Monster, and mm -hmm. big, all that. Again, photograph. is is it photograph. a... Oh, fakes. <laughs> I mean, the most famous uh, photograph has uh, is now been shown to be a fake, but could there be a uh, unknown mammal or even reptile uh, of large dimensions swimming in an Irish, in a Scottish lake? Sure there could. That we don't know about? Sure yeah. there could. Who says no? But nobody... But the evidence does not support it, does not demonstrate it. So do we say, oh, ridiculous? Yeah. No, we don't do that. We say unproved, which is a Scottish verdict. Some reviewers differ with your conclusions on this point, that you seem to say it's growing, this kind of pseudoscience. No, and, I, I, I don't, or, or sorry to interrupt. I, I, I don't. We, we've, this is part of being human. Humans have had this way of magical thinking through all of our history. The problem is that today the technology has reached formidable, maybe even awesome proportions. And so the dangers of thinking this way are larger. Not that this is a new kind of thinking. You are living with myelodysplasia. Or I have been. You have been. It's in remission. Or you have, <clears throat> what? Well, you know, with, with diseases of this sort and all cancers. Cancer it, uh, the bone marrow? It, it, it's, mild dysplasia is not exactly cancer of the bone marrow, but if untreated, it inevitably leads to leukemia. Um, and the trouble with all these diseases is you never know that you've got every last cell. Um, you can only detect down to a certain level. But down to the level that anybody can detect, and in terms of how I feel and my stamina and all that, it seems to be gone. And I'm very lucky. Because you had a sister who my sister, now my sister enabled Carrie. you to have a bone marrow transplant. That's one, and also the enormous advances in scientific, uh, in medical science, in just the last few years. If I had had this thing five or ten years ago, I would be dead sure as shooting. And then finally, the love and support of my family. All of those have played a central role. So you're optimistic? As I'm you very should. optimistic, I'm, uh, or at least very hopeful. And just share with us, because of your, your sense of, of language and, and, and your sense of understanding and, and being reflective and introspective, what, does, what do you think about and what does it do for you to I didn't to have, have any near-death say to you? I didn't no, have any near-death experiences. I, would, I didn't have a religious conversion. But, but you I thought about what it would be like to die. Certainly, and what it would be like for my, my family. Oh, right. And, and uh, I didn't much think about what it would be like for me because I don't think it's likely there's anything that you think about after you're dead. That's um, it. Huh? <laughs> yeah, long, dreamless sleep. I'd love to believe the opposite, but I don't know of any evidence. But one thing... Faith, Carl, faith. <laughs> one thing that it has done is to enhance my uh, sense of appreciation for the, the 
beauty of life uh, and of the universe and the, the sheer joy of being alive. You had a healthy portion of that before this, but even you, it happens to. Oh, there's no question. Appreciation. No of question. Beauty every moment, and life. every every inanimate object, uh, to say nothing of, of the exquisite complexity of uh, of living beings. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you imagine missing it all, and suddenly it's so much more precious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe. Pleasure. Same here. Carl Sagan, an interview conducted on May 27th, 1996. Carl Sagan died today, December 20th, 1996, age 62. He will be missed on this broadcast and by millions of PBS viewers and millions of friends around the world. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on Monday.